Hi, my name is Adrienne Lucas, and I'm the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at the One Club for Creativity. Throughout 2021, WPP and the One Club are partnering on a Lunch and Learn series that will cover a wide variety of diversity and inclusion related topics. I'm excited to kick off the series during Black History Month with today's conversation, Black, Creative, and successful. Before we get to the panel, I want to share a few housekeeping items. This is meant to be an interactive conversation, so please chat and comment throughout the session. Be sure that the chat is set to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your message. Feel free to submit a question at any time during the session by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You can upvote or like questions submitted by other attendees to move more popular questions to the top of the queue. And we are recording this session and we'll make it available to all attendees by the beginning of next week. And now I'll pass things over to Adrian Smith, the Global Director of Diversity and Inclusion at WPP, who is leading today's conversation. Of course, my full conversation and presentation was going while I was on mute and it happens all the time. So hello and welcome to everybody who has joined us. I see we have so many people in attendance. I see a shout out from London, a shout out from Brazil. Everyone is in the house for this incredible conversation um, with us today. So we got to get started. Um, I'm excited to be here. As Adrienne said, I'm Adrienne C. Smith, the Global Director of Inclusion at Diversity of diversity and inclusion at WPP. And I cannot be more excited than to help kick this lunch and learn series off that we have scheduled for you guys. We're super excited about the partnership that has been created between WPP and the One Club. And again, it's gonna be a series of five sessions. So you must stay tuned to the One Club and any notices that WPP put out because we want you to celebrate all of the partnerships that we have with the One Club, including where all the Black people, the creative boot camps, as well as the One School. Um, and we want to share the success of the relationship and all the work that all the creatives do. This month's session and this Lunch and Learn is specifically about, about Black History Month as we celebrate Black creatives. We have three super talented creatives to be here with us today. Um, we've got Elijah Brumfell, who is the co-founder and creative director of 1212 Creative. Elijah's in the house. He was also the first, hear this, the first, was it maybe 10 years ago, um, who pitched competition winners. So everyone, I want you to see Elijah as inspiration because he stood up on the stage in front of like 10 judges and pulled it off and won that first pitch conversation. Um, up next, we have Bennett Bennett, who I think is an advocate and activist, who is the principal of Aralis. Am I pronouncing that wrong? You'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and um, we also have Skylar, um, we call it One Shoot West. Top student Skylar Pendergrass is here. She's an art director at Droga 5. Um, just a course correction, Bennett was with the Creative Boot Camp. So we have all areas covered here in terms of conversation, exposure, um, and we are ready to start the conversation. I identified um, Bennett Bennett as an activist and an advocate. I'm claiming those things for myself. My journey into this advertising industry has all about been been all about providing access and opportunity to underrepresented communities. And my work still continues um, with the work that I do with WPP and other agencies and projects that I've worked on. But that's enough about me. How about the crew that we have here to talk to you today? Um, I'm going to allow each of them to kind of give you a quick rundown of who they are, what they do. And I'm going to start with e-money. I'm calling e-money, Elijah. Is that okay? I know that's corny, right? But e-money. Give us, <laughs> give us a scoop on who you are and why we chose you to come today. And how did you win? To how did you thank end you, up thank winning? You all for having me. If you could hear me, one two one two, my check. So that's how I started off. With my my check good. Right, good, 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 good. I actually, that's my birthday also, um, December twelfth. So it's like a combination of hip hop and my birthday. So that's how I came up with that name. 
Um, thank you. What's up? I am uh, Mr. Eric Elijah Brumfield. Um, I am a merge of my mother, my dad. My mom was a senior art director at Young and Rubicon. And I basically, that was my background playground when I was a younger kid. Uh, my father was a chef in Harlem. He opened up Sylvia's and he was a black chef. And my mother was one of the first made men, but made women in advertising. So basically, currently, that's what I'm doing now. A product, I just finished doing the book, Cheap Plug, Golden. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this book is uh, celebrating hip hop. And that's what I'm doing now is staying creative. I'm managing artists right now. Behind me is an artist named JV, works in Harlem. Uh, we work, we do pop shops together. Um, I'm staying active and also when I'm not creating, I'm an executive chef. Uh, me and my brother work with Marcus Samuelson and uh, we are chefs, black chefs um, at Red Rooster. And we're actually, I'm doing some consulting in New, Jer in New Jersey, in Weehawk, in, in NoHo. And that's keeping me active. So that's keeping me sharp with my, event, my visuals and it's keeping me sharp with keeping art around me. And that's me in a nutshell. I love it. So Elijah, you were the first winner of the pitch club is the pitch competition, as I mentioned, um, for where are all the black people. And I remember 10 years ago, my relationship with one with the one club is, which is why I'm so excited about being here today is years ago when Mary Warwick was the president of the one club, the where are the black people was actually just a panel discussion. But we had, you know, a heart to heart and said, Mayor, we've got to take it to the next level. We've got to find ways to allow people like Elijah and Skylar and Bennett to have some one on one activity, have some a larger exposure to be able to connect with the right. people in this industry. So what did you that first competition? What was it like? What did you do? Tell people um, who have no idea of kind of the depth of what you were required to do. And then what has it done for you since then? Uh, that's a great question, thank you. Um, basically, I knew I had an audience in front of me and I knew it was gonna be a large audience. I knew they were gonna have, if you could remind me, there was like real heavy hit of creatives there. Yes. Um, these are all the people that you wanna, everybody wants to have a meeting with. And this was like my one opportunity to have them in the audience listen to me for three minutes. Um, I didn't do, I didn't do, I did not want to do a lot of talking. I wanted to show my work. And that's basically what I did. I put together a quick three minute film of my work. So I gave the kids something to look at and I gave the audience something to look at. And I basically just emceed and I added music to it. You know, I actually added the elements of advertising, scoring, putting it together, editing a nice, pretty good, piece, I think. And I just showcased it. And while I showcased it, I added the music to it. The music had a good rhythm to it. And it, it, I, with the music, I didn't have to speak because the choices that I picked related to the kids. So then the kids were like, oh, yo, you're cool because you picked that Nas track to do that. And you picked that. So I got the, I run over the kids, but the work actually won over the creatives. And I didn't have to do it when I was talking. And I, and I was on a nine, then nine day, nine day cleanse that day. So I haven't eaten for days. So I was very serious. <laughs> yeah, I, very yeah, I, I, I can imagine, um, you know, and before I pass the mic over to, to Skylar, you know, what's important about that pitch competition and why it was so important for where all the black people um, and what was so powerful about it was that, you know, Elijah represented it and a lot of the people who also participated represent non-traditional talent, non-traditional creatives who came to that place to figure out, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a book to get into the advertising industry or to show that your creative spirit, you know, you can be a graphic artist, you can be a graffiti artist, you know, you can be a musician, you can do your own films and you just have to be able to great be a great presenter and, and connect with that creative community and the creative execs. So we're gonna come back to that, but now I wanna go over to Skylar so Skylar can give us her background and her relationship with One School West. What that's all yes. about. Yes. Hi everyone, I'm Skylar Pendergrass. 
I'm originally from Washington, DC. Shout out to my mom who's on this <laughs> webinar and also all my aunties in DC. Um, I actually grew hey, family. up- Hey, family. Hey, Bam. <laughs> and my sister who should be on here too. Um, so I grew up in Washington, DC. My mom actually worked at the Smithsonian Art Institute when I was growing up. So I actually went to preschool in a museum and I grew up just kind of overly stimulated by art every single day. And so as I was trying to think about what I wanted to do for a career after college, um, you know, working in politics just wasn't the right fit, right? Growing up in DC, you kind of think naturally that would be your next step. But for me, I wanted to do something creative, but every time I kind of got a lead to do something that was creative, it ended up not being creative. I was always creative adjacent. So I kind of started in media planning and then strategy and then creative strategy and then, you know, PR for a little bit. And all of those things I worked with creatives but I wasn't really in the creative role that I thought would be the right fit for me long-term. And so a lot of the times it's like, you're working with someone, you're brainstorming with them, you're helping them push the work to a more interesting place, but you're not actually getting the credit for the ideas that you came up with or the work that you're helping produce because you don't have that title of art director or you don't have that title of creative director or copywriter. And so it seemed like it was this magical kind of entity, uh, this magical kind of group of people that it felt impossible to penetrate. And so I think when I heard about one school, um, actually from one of my colleagues at the New York Times, I, there are a couple of New York Times people on this call too. So shout out to you as well. Thank you for joining. Um, she was like, hey, I think one school would be a perfect fit for you because you have a lot of great ideas. You have a lot of talent. Um, and I think this program, which is a 16 week program where you're, you're getting exposure to the best creatives, black creatives in the industry, um, it'll help push you to that next level and it'll help give you the guidance and the insights and the advice that you really need to kind of push your portfolio into a, a good place. And for me, that's what really kind of unlocked this position at Droga 5 as an art director is having that exposure, having that access, um, really having the time of all of these people who have been in the industry 10, 20 years um, looking at my book directly. Before one school, I was applying for art director roles and I was literally sending out links to my work with no website, just links and like a little a little summary of the work because no one had told me I needed to do a portfolio. <laughs> it's like, I'm making a lot of laughs, sorry, he's choking, right? It's like, these are the things that we don't consider um, as we're interviewing people. It's like, we kind of make the assumptions that everybody knows these things. And so that's why one school is so great is because it kind of unlocks and gives you a lot of those keys uh, for success. And that's how I got here and invited to this panel. That's awesome. And so you're doing, you're still doing some incredible work, inspiring so many people. I think half the audience that's here is all here for Skylar. So shout out to all those folks, <laughs> your family members that are here. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs> We're going to roll it over to Bennett Bennett, who I've already called an advocate and an activist. Bennett, give us your story. Tell us about your journey with the One Club, how you got involved. Give us everything. Yeah, uh, thank you for that intro, Adrian. Uh, hello from Far Rockaway, New York, uh, where I'm born and raised. Uh, my, my parents are Jamaican immigrants, so for them, advertising, public relations, marketing, these were not careers that they imagined for their kids. It was either be a lawyer, be a doctor, uh, be anything with a, a stable income and as somebody who grew up you know basically in a library down the block from my dad's tv and stereo repair shop like i was just always around stories i was always around media and i always wanted to just do stuff with it i just had this imagination as uh uh as a kid growing up there uh that you know i wanted to be a writer didn't really work out the way I planned. I started college as a physics major. <laughs> that also did not work out. Took some time off uh, from school, went back in, learned about this, uh, learned about this industry from a high old high school friend who was studying at FIT. She said, hey, I love your Tumblr blog. You can write your ass off. Have you considered working in this industry? And I didn't realize until that moment that the quilted quicker picker upper, like a slogan like that doesn't write itself. Somebody like me writes it. <laughs> and uh, I just, I went for it. And the first opportunity I was presented was, we're all the black people. Uh, literally the first uh, talent career fair where Elijah ended up winning the talent pitch. So uh, the universe is crazy like that. I found out about you know, programs like me, uh, 
schools like the City College of New York, where I eventually got my uh, ad PR degree and just like the, this wealth of opportunities. Uh, but I needed a portfolio because as a copywriter or an aspiring copywriter, uh, as I kept telling myself, I needed a book. I like, I remember walking into where all the black people, like all these pretty black and brown people, they have these portfolios, they have these resumes, they have these fly business cards. I have none of that. <laughs> all I know is I am literally from the city where Mad Men began. You know, that was that was my backyard. And I knew I needed to do something um, to just like get that stable income that my parents were, were looking for. So I found out about the One Club Creative Bootcamp. It happened to be every January right before spring. And I figured, you know what? I like competition. I like, you know, I like being around other creatives. So why don't I just try this out? And I ended up doing that competition three, three times, like three straight years. I considered doing it a fourth, but because City College is more account facing, uh, my MAPE internship wasn't necessarily the best. I loved it, loved being part of it, but didn't really have ample opportunities to build that portfolio. It was just coming back every January, being around kids from City Tech, Baruch, uh, Hunter, you know, all these CUNY schools, kids who are like paying their way through school, just like me, and taking on big clients like, you know, the US Open or uh, idealist.org, which is a, um, non it's a nonprofit job bank. And, you know, eventually I had something, you know, just, you know, late nights, all, all the things that they, you know, that the ad world says is like an actual thing. Like I was doing that as a college kid, just like trying to find my way in. And eventually I, you know, got to work at BBDO. Uh, David Lubars had announced at another where all the black people years later that they were launching a creative residency. And I was the first person selected through that program and eventually stayed there for about four years, became a journalist, covered the future of the ad agency landscape and media for the drum for a very, very crazy year, got burnt out, took some time off, reset, bounced around a few places and eventually launched my consultancy aerialist uh, last May. And not even a full month after that, the George Floyd incident happened and uh, you know, the open letter that founded 600 and rising uh, came to be. So uh, definitely, uh, I, I remember in our panel call before this, uh, you mentioned like, we're all like these alternative uh, career path creatives. And I, you know, it's kind of sunk into me that, yeah, that's definitely been the road for me. Thank you all for like sharing kind of your intro into the space. And one thing that stuck out to me most is that all of you have taken an alternative route in a way, you know, you, you thought about creativity, you thought about, you know, that's what you were passionate about. But the reality is, is that you wanted to do it. You had creative spirits and you made magic happen and your relationship with the one club sort of catapulted you into that space, into that position. Um, Elijah, once you won, you know, the one club, um, you know, pitch competition, what happened to you next? Like, give us kind of the, the two, one, two, the one, two, one, two, <laughs> give us the four, one, one on what happened to you after that. You're on mute, by the way, we can't hear you. Um, there you go. What a one, two, one, two. Don't stop. All right. One of the prizes where we had a chance to sit with um, every single ad agency, I believe, in New York City to do an interview. And um, one thing that I found when I did go get the interview, they didn't really have any positions. They had to like make a position for me, or the person that was interviewing me, maybe like four of them were like, maybe you should be sitting over here and you should be interviewing me. So it was, they, it was a, a great 
opportunity, but I didn't really find an opportunity. Um, or they had to, the people I was interviewing with, they, had, they didn't really have that much power to make a hole for me. So I had to, I had to went back to Jimmy Smith and I had said, Jimmy, get paso. I went to all the spots and no one gave me any love. And he gave me an opportunity. He was like, you know what? Um, I got a project that's coming up. You're an art director. You're a great art director. And this is what you're going to do. And we started, we did a, a pitch for Burlington Co Factory, where I incorporated Run DMC and Jay Z. And I did a real nice um, scoring. Because I know Jimmy Smith, if you all know, he's really known for his musical um, incorporation with the product that he's working with Nike, Gatorade, et cetera. I did the same method. I was like, oh, I know what Jimmy likes, so let me do something with that. He loved it. They went crazy. I submitted it. Everyone went crazy. They submitted it. Um, they didn't win. They loved the creative. They didn't win the strategy. So that wasn't on me. That was on them. So <laughs> I, but they loved the creative. And Jimmy, I had, I started, that's what started a great relationship with me and Jimmy Smith. And I still have that relationship with him to this day. And that's what I did. That was the greatest gift or prize that I did get from the contest was to have a relationship with another mentor that could guide me through the years of being, following the same footsteps that he's doing and then applying that same wisdom to, to who's on this call right now. And that's, I love the opportunity with that. And it gave me a nice, pretty nice check also. So that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> gave me a nice promo check, so I was able to move. <laughs> so that was cool. <laughs> Definitely, checks are always good. Um, <laughs> You know, one other thing or key thing that you mentioned was the mentorship. You know, you talked about going to each of the agencies and how, you know, it seemed like no one was purely kind of seeing the talent within and gave you the line of, you know, you know more than me. But the reality is, is that, you know, you don't have that opportunity within their agency. So you needed someone to be an advocate for you or a sponsor for you, right. a mentor for you. So some of that is, is super important in, in order for you know all of us in whatever field you are in to get to the next level, to get to the next step. So you know you mentioned Jimmy was your sponsor um, or you know your mentor sponsor. He definitely was a sponsor if he called you in for the job. And that's what sponsorship is about calling you Ooh. in. You know, Skylar and Bennett and you know Skylar I'll let you go first. Who would you say have been some sponsors or mentors for you in this journey? Yeah, um, I think I'm really lucky that I've had mentors all along the way. You know, I am an AKA. So my first uh, job out of college was actually through one of my pro fights. Gigi, I don't know if she's on here. I saw Shakira's on here. Dominique's on here. A lot of my sorority sisters are actually in attendance right now. And so that was my first introduction into advertising. And I think um, as I've continued to progress and move on, I've been blessed to have mentors even at the New York Times. You know, Esther is on here as well. She was a, the editorial director at the New York Times and she helped guide me and push me in the right direction. Um, and I think one great thing about One School is that each participant gets a one on one mentorship relationship. So through One School, I actually was connected with a creative director at Facebook. And so she was the one who actually sat with me and went through my portfolio, like concept by concept, line by line, to, to tell me that hey, I know you have a strategic background and that's really strong and you're, you're really great at finding the right insight. Um, but when you're actually applying for a creative role, like this is how you should position yourself. These are the keywords that you should use. This is the language that you need to unlock the position. And so I think every mentor I've had along the way has kind of like unlocked the next step for me. Um, but I do have to say that the one school mentor was the one who was able to kind of push me over this hump. I don't know if Lydia's on this call, but like shout out to you, girl, because you were really with me in the trenches as we were going through the portfolio. Um, but I do think it's just so important because as a hiring manager, she knows what she's looking for when she's going through a portfolio and she's hiring art directors and she's hiring copywriters. And she was able to give me all of that insight. Um, and so I think, you know, as a mentor, that's just so invaluable and so important for, you know, people who are trying to get to the next stage or people who are trying to kind of do a career change like I did. It's like, I don't know what I don't know. And so having that mentorship is so incredibly important. Thank you. Bennett, tell us about yours. Yeah, uh, I feel like I was just raised by this industry uh, between just 
the awesome collective of DEI professionals like Tiffany Edwards or uh, Tracy uh, Tracy Smith, who both came from the One Club, uh, but then just really interesting left of center creatives. Uh, one of my core uh, mentors to this day is Husani Oakley. Uh, he's chief technology officer at Deutsch. Uh, back when I was like intern, junior level, he was at Wyden and Kennedy and spoke to spoke to me, you know, during one of my internships. And I wanted to be like that guy. Like he had published, you know, he had a launch his own like media magazine at one point and was doing all this crazy cool stuff with with Wyden. And I always considered myself, all right, I can write anything. Like I want to be with around people who are going to challenge me in the ways that I, I want to learn. You know, I very much care about the future. It's uh, part of the core to what Aerialist does. Uh, we work with forward thinking brands for content and cultural strategy. So, you know, having that sort of mentor that, you know, is able to pass wisdom from essentially like just what he's doing with his life, you know, what it's like being, being a black guy. He's also queer. So navigating the, you know, the terrain there and, you know, for me, you know, just, on, you know, just doing all that I could, but always having that person where if I needed him to, you know, if I needed to talk to him, he would, you know, keep a, you know, he'd keep a ear open for me. You know, those things were important as, you know, I just moved up and up and up and he was moving up and up and up too. And yeah, I can't say enough that when you start off in the business, like even as an intern, especially if you're black, people consider you like mentor, like college kids consider you mentor material so early on that it can't like, it's a bit of pressure for us. Cause you know, we're just trying to figure it out. You know, we barely, uh, you know, make it in, in an age, a full-time agency job and people, people see you, people look at what you end up doing and uh, you know, to be able to, you know, lean on people like Usani or Carl Desir, who's leading DEI at, at Netflix, like really, really great, great guys. And, you know, th sometimes it doesn't feel like there are that many black men in the industry. So to be able to lean on them when I can is, uh, is awesome. That's excellent. One thing I want to know, um, or I want you guys to kind of talk to the people about, we've got like over a hundred plus people in the chat. I'm not sure where people are in their creative journey, um, but what advice, you know, and I think you guys do similar, but very different things. Um, what advice would you give like a person trying to get into this industry? I know, you know, at different age levels, you know, not calling out anybody's age at all, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Elijah with the gray. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding with you. Um, but understanding where you guys all fit in and that if you've got this creative spirit and creative gene, there's no kind of bound or anything that holds you back from getting into this industry. Um, what advice would you give to anybody that's trying to get into this, this industry? And that can go to anybody. I can jump in with that one. Yeah. Um, for me personally, I feel like the two things I would say is one, just being open, open-minded, right? Like listening to everybody that tries, that gives you advice and testing out everything that people say for you to do. I think for me, because it was, it took such a long time to get here that I just was like, I'll try anything. <laughs> and I think when I kind of shifted to that mindset of let me just listen and be an open book, um, that really helped me get to where I am. And I think the second piece is that you know, I'm an art director, so there are some tangible skills required to do the job that I'm doing. You know, I need to be an illustrator. I need to be in Photoshop. I need to understand those programs pretty well. And so, you know, there's a lot of free resources and a lot of resources like, you know, LinkedIn Learning, even, you know, they bought Linda, um, lynda.com. So I just do as many tutorials as you can to get those core competencies. Those are things that you can teach yourself, but if you don't know them, they could potentially hold you back. And so I think once I was able to kind of marry the openness with the tangible skills is kind of what unlocked this role for me. So did you go to portfolio school or no? No portfolio school? Just wanna, no. 
so I did a program at UC Berkeley to learn to take some classes on Illustrator and Photoshop and InDesign. So okay. I did take those classes and then I did one school. So I, cause I knew like, I personally can't teach myself. I don't have the, the discipline. Um, so I did uh, seek out those classes at Berkeley and then I did one school, which taught me more about how to think. Fantastic. Bennett. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if there's any two things, one, remember what got you here. Uh, I, I floundered through three different colleges and, uh, you know, felt as if I was so much later than my peers who graduated high school with me. Everybody was at least like two, two, three years ahead. And I spent so much of my career in my own head trying to catch up. Uh, but, you know, I think so much of what drives me is just like being so tied to passion, being so tied to purpose, being so tied to the things that would light me up as a kid uh, that, you know, that's going, you know, that became all the stuff that that's gotten me here today. You know, I, I love helping. I love, uh, you know, solving problems, you know, which is really great for advertising, but also, you know, brings me so much closer to a lot of the issues that permeate through the culture that we have an impact on. Obviously, racial justice is one of those things. Uh, my family went through Superstorm Sandy, so climate change and environmental justice are also two things that I deeply care about as a person. So, you know, when you are building your book, when you are making your way through the industry, you know, finding those things that light you up, especially on the days when it gets heavy, you know, it gets heavy as black talent sometimes feeling like you are carrying more than just yourself into these meetings, into these interviews. So always like, you know, it's bigger than a side hustle for a lot of us. <laughs> it is so much bigger than just saying, oh, I've got a cute little five to nine. You know, I've gotten to meet so many dope individuals who become friends and partners and uh you know even clients that just want to do something bigger they know they represent a community they know they represent a specific like part of the black experience you know me being first gen jamaican american like i want to be able to give back to the caribbean american community and tell more diverse stories you know even with even amongst ourselves so i think that's you know number one and Number two, I just saw a really good friend of mine, a really great advocate for uh, for me over these years. He just got a new job. And I remember him giving me the advice that like, you get opportunities in life, but like you also get shots. Like there are so many opportunities out there and like take as many as you like, as you can, you know, allow yourself time for self care. But when you see those shots, like those are the thing, those are the bigger opportunities that define your, not just your career, but who, who you say you are every day when you look in the mirror. So uh, whenever you get those shots or whenever you have those people that allow you to take those shots, take those big chances on yourself, you know, make sure you appreciate them at every step you get, but always make sure to like, remember, you know, for lack of a better word, who the F you are because you know you you leaned into you know the discomfort the fear and said you know what like i'm just gonna make it happen in my way i love it elijah tell us what advice um, would you have would you give to the young people or the people in general who are aspiring get, creatives we're gonna get into that. i would say um definitely be ready for the show um similar to our Similar to Skylar, I'm, I work with art, being an art director. My mom was an art director. And me being a young kid, walking to White as a young kid, my mom was kind of fly. She was kind of hip. She, she kind of was kind of hip. And that was the art, that's an art director thing. And I thought to my mom, which is cool. So I would just say, stay cool, stay current, be ready for showtime. You know, this is a platform. And always, the presentation is always key. And always, there's always, room to sharpen up your presentation skills and to show things and not do a lot of talk. It's better to be like, you could say you're a photographer or you could be like, it's just showing your work. You could say you're this, you could say you're that, but if you show it, that's what advertising is all about. 
So I say always sharpen your work and be ready to show it. And when it's time to show it, be ready for the speech to back up your work. Yeah. One thing you mentioned was that your mom was a part of the advertising industry. And I know for a lot of people of color, we don't know about the advertising industry until we're like damn near in it or like, you know, after college. It's not like a career path that we think about. Um, but you were in it, you had exposure. What, and, and, and this is kind of like a, a throw out question to all of you guys what are you doing to help the next generation learn about advertising? learn about the work that you're doing? Um, how are you being evangelists for this creative industry? Well, right now, it's good. That's what I do is I'm creating avenues where I need help. I'm cre creating product to actually sell, to monetize. And I need help with creatives to put together the team or put together the machine. I can't, no one does, no one does anything by themselves. If anyone tells you they do something by themselves, get away from them. Um, I would say the, the best thing is what I'm doing now is I'm creating an avenue where I could bring on a young creative that will show me and help me sharpen up something that I don't know about where, you know, these new creators right now, I call them ninjas. They're doing things that that my mom wasn't doing. My mom was drawing storyboards for Pan Am and Bird's Eye. So she was drawing this stuff and then showing it. So I will just, and I, and that's what I would share with the new generation. I had, I did few black children were able to run around in a set and see a, a actual idea turn into a TV, actual commercial. So that's what I'm doing now. I am, um, I'm involved with movie production right now. I'm involved with, um, <laughs> yeah, movie production, publishing. And once you're doing something, if you have something that you're showing, like a product, like I like showing my book, there's something I could leave and people could look at it it's like a portfolio. People could look at it and I'm not talking anymore. It's in my work is talking for me. So I always say, have your work talk for you, instead of doing what I'm doing right now, doing a lot of talking. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Skylar? What are you doing to to you know bring the next generation into the fold? Yeah, I think Bennett actually touched on it earlier in terms of the younger generation just looking at you like you have it all figured out already, even though we're still all kind of going through the motions and figuring it out as we go. For me, the one thing I'm doing is just holding space and making myself available. Um, there are constantly people who reach out to me for advice or feedback or someone's cousin, someone's friend, you know, a former colleague, someone I worked with for two seconds that was a freelancer. Um, I make space for all of those calls. It, it can be exhausting because I spend like three or four hours a week talking to just various people. I think especially now on the heels of one school and the new job at Droga 5, there are a lot of curious, um, younger black creatives who want to know like how I did it and figured it out. And I think the only thing I can do right now is give my time because I don't have any ca kind of capacity to hire um, like Elijah. So for me, it's just about making space, giving advice. And because I've honestly had about five careers at this point. Um, I can talk about strategy. I can talk about media planning. I can talk about art direction. I can talk about almost every agency in LA because even if, if I haven't worked there, I've applied there. So I probably know some hiring manager or HR person that I can give out the contact information to. So for me, it's about just as much as I've struggled and as much as I've had to figure out all of the spreadsheets I've made for you know who's who and who's where and what's what, like. I'm happy to share all that information out as consistently and as uh, constantly as possible. Bennett, you have anything to add to that? And you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, uh, goodness. Uh, so yes, uh, I'm sure a lot of people became a little bit more familiar with me, you know, eight or so months ago when I co-founded 600 and Rising and, you know, we're very, 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 very much geared to advocate for Black talent in all aspects of their uh, career paths through the industry, whether that's like getting them in the door. Obviously, there's so many great programs that do that, but also making sure that we can close the opportunity gap once we're in the door. 
making sure we can get pay equity for uh, for ourselves uh, and clearly our other BIPOC peers, uh, allowing ourselves to, you know, better enable the dope DEI practitioners doing the work because they are like so overly capable, but sometimes so under budget <laughs> to get the stuff that they need to out of the door. Uh, so we're working on a lot, you know, I'm easily reachable, Bennett at 600 and rising.com. I have an open door policy. I'm here to do the work. Uh, you know, one of the things that got me through so much of my career, uh, being the New Yorker, uh, one of the, there's actually two advertising high schools in New York city. I actually named one of those schools called Mecca in lower Manhattan. Uh, mm -hmm. it is a grade, uh, what is it? 12 through 16. So high school plus two years of free college education. Uh, really, really big deal. I've been with them from even before day one. And it's crazy to see all the graduating classes uh, actually get jobs, get crazy internship opportunities, be toe to toe with some of the brightest uh, talented agency people. I'm a huge evangelist for that. Uh, so yeah, you know, me, our board, uh, it's getting around that we are on a search for an executive director. So I should share that. So we are operationalizing our mission so that we can be here for the long haul. There's been so much good change over the last few years since I've been it, in it, but it's time to really step on the gas. Like society needs more of us in these rooms. We need to make sure that, you know, the people who get to be in these rooms can put out uh, great stories that show a fuller representation of what we can be as Black people. And, you know, it's been an honor to carry this organization this far and happy to work with anybody who, you know, wants to make change with us. Can I add one quick, one quick oh, note? Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to add one thing that Bennett touched on, which I think is super important, is salary transparency. Um, that is one thing I feel like comes up constantly and even talking to other one school graduates, you know, talking about salary and being transparent about what I've made in the past, what I'm making now, you know, some of that can lead to 20, 30 K added um, salary base for what they're asking for, for some of these agencies. And there are tiers within each title. So one art director could be making X and another art director could be making Y and you won't know any of that or close that gap unless you're talking about it. And they can avoid kind of being called out for discrimination because they do have these tiers in each title. So I think that's one thing that's super important um, is just to talk about is to talk about your salary and not shy away from it. Yeah, that that's great to hear. We want to ask people in the last maybe 12 minutes that we have left, you know, you guys have opened the door to give back and answer some of the questions for all of our, you know, 100 plus attendees. Um, so we encourage everyone from, you know, the audience to ask questions. We've already had two posed. Um, one is a specific question um, to the One Club that says, you know, does the One Club have a place where you can post your portfolio? So Adrian or Lucy or Tegan, um, if you could share that, if that's an answer, put it in the chat, that would be great. Um, the other question um, is like, what about individuals 50 plus? You know, is there a space in place for, um, or any advice you have for people 50 plus who are just exploring their creative sensibilities? pull up. <laughs> I personally say pull up. You know, my dad's pushing 80. I've had the privilege of hanging with my parents for the last year, you know, uh, and my dad's always been the most creative person in my life. You know, band guy back in his Jamaica days, like brilliant artist in his own right. And, you know, I, I just, I do not believe that we as an industry should be thinking, oh, just because we are you know, aiming for the, the biggest movers of, of like money through corporate America. And right now that seems to be what late millennials, Gen Z, you know, starting to get into Gen Alpha, that you just phase older professionals out. Like that, that's not fair. That undercuts the experience that they bring, their, willing, their willingness to learn, <laughs> their willingness to, you know, push a, you know, they, they understand how greatly digital this world has become, but obviously there, there's ways to, to innovate at any, any part of your career. So 
I, I personally got no problem with it. I know it, I know ageism is a huge discussion mm -hmm. that still isn't talked about, you know, aside from maybe Derek Walker and Cindy Gallup on Twitter, right? Two really great voices in that space. Uh, I've learned, like, I feel like I punch above my weight class just because I've just tried to listen to the older people in the room. We have, we still have so much to learn from y'all. Anyone else wanna tackle that or, or chime in on that? I mean, the industry as a whole is a young skewing industry, but we definitely need to create opportunities or some of us get to a point where you're like, I'm burnt out, you know, from this creative space, but it does not cre create a, we don't want that gap there. We want all ages, everybody with the creative spirit, energy and talent, most of all, to be able to be in this industry and make, you know, and be a force of change and creativity. So I think that's amazing. Um, Morgan Fikes, hey Morgan, um, had a comment that says, with so many creative roles that sometimes overlap, this is a question, in responsibility, how do you determine the right role for you? I can answer that even though Morgan is my sister, so there's <laughs> that. <laughs> I can also you talk about this. I know Morgan. Morgan <laughs> yeah, she and I were in um, Marrakesh together. Yep, she just texted me that. Um, <laughs> before this. Uh, so I think part of the issue in advertising is that every job posting means something different, right? So art director at one company means something totally different than art director at a different company. Um, and so I think it's when you get into the door, when you're interviewing, it's good to kind of clarify that and what the role actually is. Like, I think one way of doing that is, um, you know, what does the day to day of this job look like? And where does, you know, where does my job start and the other job uh, where does my job stop and someone else's job begins, I think are good clarifying questions to kind of understand like if the role is what you're actually looking for, because, you know, a lot of art director roles are more graphic designer or design roles. And that's not something I was interested in, right? Like I wanted a, a role where I was going to be a thinker and really kind of digging up those insights and finding out kind of new human truths to put into advertising. And as an art director, I get to do that at Droga5, but at an art, as an art director in another company, I might not get to do that. So I think being really transparent and really clear about what you want to do and kind of holding the hiring manager to account for that. Yeah, I agree. There's so many different roles that have the same title, but do totally different things. And it depends on the culture of the agency. It depends on, you know, the role and the setup within that individual space. Um, so having a conversation about what are the true requirements of this job title and position, you know, is definitely a critical conversation to have. Um, we mentioned a little bit, we'd go back to the 50 plus um, category of like what is possible. There are a lot of agencies, and thanks Adrian for bringing that up, um, that are doing returnships um, where people who have been out of the industry for a while who may have taken breaks either to have children or retired and wanted to come back are actually exploring returnship opportunities. And it's just like um, an internship, but you've already worked in the industry. You have lots of experience, but you're returning after a time period off. So exploring with agencies about those type of opportunities are always a good ask to have. And we're open for more questions. Um, or comments, E, you look like you have something to say. Or Craig Walker had just posted one up that says, and this is for the group, what advice do you have for passionate creatives, particularly those in senior roles outside of mainstream major league markets looking to break in? I feel like I think about this so much, even though like I'm technically in a major market, but when I was at the drum, uh, I covered the entire US really. So I was just in contact with so many, like so many people from the Midwest, the Gulf Coast, uh, Pacific Northwest, you know, stuff that wasn't widened in Kennedy. And I mean, I was so impressed by that, by so much of the work that was coming out of those places, like so much more than a lot of the stuff that comes out of the major markets themselves. And I think one, do not short sell yourself. If you are good at what you do, like you'll be able to find a way to, you know, to shine uh, from it. Uh, two, like literally everywhere is a major market now. 
like we're all at home <laughs> we're all at home so this is almost the biggest like blind interview in history because you don't have to fly out to another place like spend money do all these things just to like look good for an employer that you know otherwise would probably have made you like uproot your entire life you know you don't have to do that anymore like so craig like you're literally like your office your space wherever that is like make that your major market like <laughs> like show out shine like do whatever you need to do to like continue doing great work and like there is literally no excuse for any good agency wherever that is to say all right let's let's bring you on to the next you know to the next level of your career with us i, 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 I was gonna say i love that feedback uh bennett because you know COVID has put us all at an evil you know almost like an equal playing field because we're all at home we all have access now to the same type of information hopefully to be able to disseminate information show how creative we can be in this this space. Skylar, what were you gonna say? I was just gonna add that a lot of these brands are actually trying to talk to the people in whatever market you're in, yep. right? So bringing those unique insights to the table is another way of kind of positioning yourself um, as you're applying for roles in different cities or applying for roles at different agencies. It's so important that we you know, have those insights. And if you're on the ground there, like you might know things about your city that can be the next ad, right? Or be the next, major campaign or be the next whatever. And so don't think that that's a negative. Those are things that make you unique and are actually super valuable and why these ad agencies, even before the pandemic, were paying for relocation fees because they want those insights and those insights are extremely um, valuable. Elijah, are you gonna add in? Yeah, I wanted to say something um, just for experience. And I know I'm a numbers guy, so people like talking numbers. Um, the way I really got into the, into advertising is it wasn't through my mom and that, I just saw that, but the way I actually did it was doing voiceovers and I started doing voiceovers and that's something that people could do at their 62s. I know a lot of 62s, 50 plus, they are making six figures by doing voiceovers. For me doing voiceovers, that led to me doing nine commercials with Uniworld and I ended up starring in the commercials from those nine national commercials led up to another yeah, 6G, yeah, you're around, yeah, it's a six figure check. So, and this is me with no portfolio. This is just me just started by me doing a voiceover. And then that voiceover led to, you know what, you guys are so great. We want to do a national commercial on you. And me and my boy looked at each other like, us? Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm on TV DJing for Burger King. It was for Burger King commercials. So I was the actual Burger King commercial DJ. Sorry, I, I had to take it. But <laughs> it was an experience and it got me in. And then all of a sudden I'm doing nine commercials. I have a nine, nine commercial reel and it just, just helped, you know, do the spark. So I would say, get a shine on, get your shine on somehow. And don't really lead with your 62. Don't really lead that you're 50. Lead with your work and your talent. And then you, your age will look more as a wisdom, more as an OG than you looking like the, the old, creative trying to get in. <laughs> yeah, to, I, always, I would say I lead that. with the work. I love that, Elijah. <laughs> lead with your talent, no matter how old you are, what right. phase you are in your career, but your talent speaks volumes um, over anything. So thanks, Nadine, for mentioning, you know, being able to listen, learn to, I saw you in the comments and um, wanted to shout you out for being a part of this conversation too. Um, you know, making sure that you show the talent. Like you say, don't talk about it, be about it, show the work. Elijah, hold your book up one more time, you know, so people can see the work, you know, that you're putting out there, plug it every chance you get. We have one minute left um, in this chat. And I just, with this one minute, I wanna say, Elijah has another book that he's share, sharing. <laughs> um, thank you guys for all participating in this conversation. Um, the One Club, you know, of creativity is definitely an organization that if you have not been involved with or know about, please explore, go to their website, learn more information about the work that they're doing. Um, this is the first of five Lunch and Learns that is being hosted by WPP. Just a straight plug for WPP, their 15 agencies 
um, that support the One Club and all the great work that they do. Please explore WPP for all the agencies that are participating in supporting this great organization. Coming up in March, there's another um, Lunch and Learn that's being led by um, Christina Milan, who's gonna talk about the great work um, for accessibility um, that happens that, and, and she's just mind blowing. So you have to join in that conversation. Um, again, we wanna thank Skylar, Bennett and Elijah. You have been incredible. You are inspiring. I might pull out a pad and take a class and learn some creative stuff from you because it's never too late and we're just gonna show the work. Um, so you guys, thanks again, Adrian, Tegan um, and Lucy, we appreciate having us and we hope to be able to join you guys again. Thank you so much for coming to today's panel, everyone. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Adrian, uh, for moderating. I hope those of you in the audience learned something new and had a chance to engage in the conversation. I invite you to check out the stories on our Instagram page at the One Club for Creativity to see our Black History Month campaign and also look out for emails for next month's Lunch and Learn. Take care, everyone.